choice of military models has grown over the last few years and there's an absolute plethora of, of various figures that are available on the market today. Really it's just down to your own personal choice what type of models you'd like to actually produce. Many people will be familiar with 172nd, sometimes referred to as HO00 scale, which was very popular, particularly our childhoods. So we can hark back to the times when we made um, possibly Airfix and Ravel kits of uh, tanks and vehicles of this scale. Um, they're a good starting point for learning how to paint figures, but more recently the scales have got bigger and bigger. The most popular scale is uh, 132nd scale or 54mm scale as uh, seen on this Latore figure for Roman Cavalry General. There are absolutely amazing amount of 54mm scale figures and it's a very popular scale to, to work in. This leads us up to the model which we'll be preparing and painting. It's a resin 1 9th scale figure so there's uh, plenty of work to do here. Right, well we've got uh, some quite large, noticeable, uh, recognisable components. This is fairly typical of a, of a resin figure, and nice pieces. But I don't think the SS Fallschirmjäger probably wore ice skate, so uh, that need to be removed, as well as other pieces um, such as the helmet and uh, various grenades and, and pouches etc. Uh, which have excess uh, material. It can be quite a difficult uh, thing to remove but I'll show you sort of how to do that and uh, it uh, shouldn't be too much of a problem. The worst problems um, are large excess moulding plugs which need to be removed with a, a razor saw or quicker but quite a dangerous uh, way of doing it, a razor saw um, attachment on a, on a mini drill. And there you go, <laughs> it's uh, kind of quite cleanly there. Most of the material came off in that large moulding plug, but there is still a little bit of excess material which really needs to be smoothed out so that the helmet fits on correctly when we assemble it. This can be done in a couple of ways. I can uh, use the scalpel, which will get it even, but also you could actually just put wet or dry paste on a flat surface As you can see, that's uh, pretty much got that, that level. As we're only relying on the strength of the glue, which will be the cyanoacrylate superglue, to hold pieces together, it's uh, often a good idea to drill and pin certain parts of the figure. Um, I'll just demonstrate drilling and pinning of um, the head to the torso. You'll require a piece of anything like welding rod or old wire coat hangers which can easily just be stipped off in small sections and used. We've got a piece of wire here. Basically make sure you've got a drill that's the same sort of diameter and uh, first of all drill a hole in the torso. Just, just check to see that the uh, the rod fits in there, it uh, fits quite nicely. Now it's not always easy to locate the dead centre to mate up parts such as the neck and the um, shoulders to line these up. So uh, really a good idea is just have a good look and study and um, approximate where the, the hole should be drilled on the head. So it looks like it's almost dead centre in there. You can actually bend the pin um, if necessary but um, if all else fails another pin can be drilled off centre to locate it. It's just really purely for strengthening. There's absolutely no problem with the cosmetic uh, look of this. So um, I'll drill a hole in the net. There it is. Now even, even without any glue that is quite a nice snug fit. 
any of the main pieces such as the arms, the torso to the leg section and the feet to the legs benefit from uh, drilling and pinning. Quite often uh, it's good to put hands on the end of wrists with small pins. It makes for a good strong figure. Uh, the other uh, points of attachment uh, such as the arms I should uh, probably rely on their existing moulded location points which are very accurate. We've got to the stage now where we'll uh, prime the uh, components of the figure. The, uh, the primer that I generally choose to use is um, just an ordinary automotive uh, car spray acrylic grey primer. The grey primer is a great base uh, for the equipment and uh, uniform etc. Sometimes a white primer would be better for uh, heads and hands, that type of thing, but um, it's, it's a light grey so it's quite a, a neutral shade. It's generally uh, quite good and acceptable for most applications. Now I've turned the helmet upside down because uh, obviously it's difficult to get the underneath covered very well. So um, I'll give that a, just a fine dust coat to begin with. Everything will just get a very fine dust coat. Holding this I'm just going to spray from under the chin to get a, a good start on it. Don't be put off that it looks very wet at this stage because it has got a, a tendency to look alarmingly sort of wet and thick but it's actually not too bad at all. And if you just help the drying with a hair dryer it's beginning to shrink back and it looks uh, quite respectable. Now it's important to note that sometimes it's difficult to get paint into areas like the ears because of undercuts and the aerosol can can't necessarily get into there. So you have to be persistent and, and build up coats. So we'll just uh, be mindful that the inside of the, the helmet, it's important to spray that as well because that will need to be painted inside as well as out. Uh, you don't want lack of paint anywhere really. Now the, uh, the thing is to keep an eye on what areas have been covered and just try to build up coat. And uh, it may look uh, like you're putting a lot of paint on at this stage but it does actually shrink back when the spirit evaporates there's not that much actual paint on there by the time that's that's uh, got a couple of coats of primer on making sure not to obscure the the rivet detail that should look quite nice there shouldn't be any problems at all everything's going a quite consistent finish now which is good So once everything is uh, primed to this stage, all there is really is to um, assemble the complete figure uh, ready for painting. So we've got to this stage and now comes the, for me, the most exciting part is actually starting to paint, getting some colour on him and, um, and hopefully bringing the figure to life. And the important thing is to get everything together and put all the other pieces in a safe place, out of harm's way until they're required. It's a good idea just to get them away from the area totally in case anything's lost or damaged. For many years modelers have used the old standby which has always uh, been enamel paints. For many years I've used these and to great effect but in recent years I've turned to the use of uh, Vallejo acrylics and also life colour acrylics but there are still various uses for other makes and brands of paint for specialist effects so I have quite a selection of, uh, of paints for different jobs for the purpose of this figure um, I've chosen to use a mixture of the model air range from Vallejo and uh, life colour uh, which are made in Italy it's a common misconception that, that either a brush or an airbrush is used when, when painting a figure. Um, I find that uh, the combination of both the airbrush and uh, brushwork gives exactly what you want. The airbrush really is great for improving textures and giving nice graduated tonal effects. But where the airbrush work finishes and the brushwork begins is really the, the nitty gritty of getting the best out of a figure. 
when brush painting, a large selection of varying sizes of brush are required for all sorts of different jobs. I generally like to keep some nice fine points such as this 5-0 which is extremely fine. That's great for painting very fine details such as eyes. A useful size to have is something like a number 2 brush which can hold a reasonable amount of paint. Uh, this is ideal for painting uh, reasonably large areas or comparatively large areas. So once those base colours uh, are applied, something like a double O or, or like this 3 O are ideal for things such as eyes and uh, very, very fine details. Sable brushes, if they're looked after, can be used for quite a few years, but um, the smaller ones tend to, to wear out quite easily. Also, I tend not to throw away older brushes. These can always come in handy for a technique known as dry brushing, which is a great technique for enhancing and highlighting fine molded detail. I have an absolutely disgusting looking brush here, which has got super glue and all sorts of stuff on it. It looks horrendous, I know. But um, this started life as a model aircraft doping brush, and the brushes were about that long originally. Airbrushing is a a branch of the hobby um, that I started to take interest in in about 1980. The best airbrushes that I, I've ever used and um, I'm, I'm pleased to, to show you are um, the, the Iwata um, airbrushes and this is the Iwata Eclipse SBS. Now this is a particularly good airbrush. It can be used for large coverage, big areas as well as painting very very tiny details. It really is a, a superb model. That's the one that I use most of the time. As I mentioned earlier, I choose to use different types of paint and because of their varying characteristics. I found that both Model Air and Life Color are, are very good paints. I find that the Life Color gives a nice, extremely matte finish. So what I'll do is use the Life Color to do the base color, and then I'll add a, a secondary um, shading color um, using the model air because the model air um, has a, a much better capability uh, being thinned um, and I'd be able to actually lay a nice um, subtle um, shading over the top of the um, uh, the life colour base. Uh, going by the box illustration I'm going to initially use a, a field grey colour which is a part of a series of, of uniform colours so I'm just going to shake that up It looks like it's quite well mixed. Prime the airbrush with tap water. You can use a, a distilled water or something like that, but I find that the tap water is perfectly okay. So I'm just gonna make sure that the airbrush is clean. Now I've just got a tiny drop of water in, in, in the bottom of the bowl. And I'm gonna pour some color in. And again, just stir that. Now this particular colour is probably two or three shades lighter than the desired colour that I want at the end of it. If you start with a lighter colour then you can shade to a darker colour and rather than highlight and shade this colour as it's lighter will act as the highlight colour. So in actual fact you're just using this almost like a, another form of primer. And you probably just heard that sound, which is the compressor cutting in. It uh, constantly keeps to a, a standard pressure. Generally I work at about 25 psi, which is a bit more than some people like to use. It's all down to uh, personal taste. Because of the undercuts and the way the trousers of the figure disappear up underneath the smock, I need to spray the grey colour right into all the extremities. This will partially act as a primer. This area will be shaded with a secondary colour. So we'll just start to put this in and get some coverage on the legs. At this stage, as it's the only colour, uh, we don't need to worry about masking. But as you can see, uh, because it's got a fairly good 
prime nozzle the overspray uh, can be kept to a minimum between the, the different colours so uh, you can more or less paint just the trouser area uh, without encroaching onto uh, the jump smock or, or any adjacent areas So while I'm doing this, I'm constantly aware that if I'm putting too much paint on and it's a bit too damp or it, it, any chance that it might run, the old hairdryer um, is underneath my bench, which I'll take out and just dry off this coat so that I can build up another coat. Under certain lights you can see the way shadows will fall on creases. This helps to choose when accentuating these with paint. Some people choose a natural single light source, i.e. from uh, the top left or top right of a figure. Um, I tend to just shade from all directions just to accentuate the depth of the figure from the outside inwards rather than thinking of a a hypothetical light source. And the reasoning behind this is that I believe that if you imagine there's a light source from a certain direction, if the figure's placed in a natural light situation where it's got a conflicting light, this illusion's instantly shattered. So I tend to just shade with the idea that the highest spots are lighter and darker areas are darker. But it's uh, really a matter of choice and down to your eye and how you interpret light and shade. Using uh, German green, it's actually a bit like a field grey colour. Start to add some shading. I'm going to start up in the, in the deepest recesses. It'd probably be difficult to see this. It's a good idea to shade a little bit darker up where the the smock overhangs the trousers just to give an idea of depth everybody looks at uh, things in a different way and the thing is the creases can be airbrushed according to your taste just going to add some black to the grey mix so I'll get a much better contrast with the shading. Going up in the brush area, I'm going to spray where the uh, smock overhangs. Just emphasise a bit of depth there. See that gives it a much better contrast than the, the previous colour. But it's better just to be a bit on the safe side when you uh, begin to add shading colours. You don't want it to go uh, instantly to the darkest shade before you try using a subtle changing tone. Now that I've done the trousers, my uh, attention turns to the camouflage as shown on the box art, which shows tan water camouflage. And um, I have a, a reference of this in a Historian Collections book. Although it's not the same smock as used on the uh, Fulsherm Jaeger, it's pretty much the same type of camouflage as seen. And this is shown here in quite good detail. So uh, going by this reference, um, it's uh, very much like some of the uh, German armoured fighting vehicles of that period. There's a three colour for camouflage. There's a base colour which looks like a dark yellow. So we're looking at a base colour and uh, I've looked at my various colours and the uh, life colour tropical tan looks quite a good match for the illustration at the top of the page here. What I'll do now is mask the trouser area in order to put a base colour on which to add the secondary uh, camouflage colours. So what we want to do is to follow the line of the trousers around each leg as neatly as possible. The look of it doesn't matter too much as long as that very top leading edge 
where the two colours join um, is uh, relatively neat. So once you've got uh, the, the top part like that, just to be doubly sure, just mask generally over the, the rest. It may look untidy, but as long as everything is uh, sealed up to the edges, that's all you need it to do. It doesn't look pretty, but it'll do the job. At this stage, uh, I think it's a good um, point to have a look at um, a genuine camouflage garment and look at some of the pitfalls and things that you have to deal with when actually painting a scale camouflage effect. This is um, an original 1942 pattern Denison smock and as worn by the Paris in, in the invasion. As you can see that there are actually only three colours involved in this camouflage and it's interesting to note that although there are only three colours there are variations where each colour overlaps which make other colours which compounds the, um, the effect of the camouflage Right, so we'll just check that's coming. That's coming out fine. So I just slight, just dust this on to begin with. Do a light dust coat all over. Now we'll just tilt this up, and uh, it's a good idea just to start by spraying up underneath all the the undercuts. Certain directions. Uh, you won't get good coverage into the nooks and crannies so uh, if you hold the figure and spray upwards I normally do that first try and get it up uh, underneath first you can't see when the figure's standing level it'll need another good coat after this but uh, we're getting into all the little bits and pieces now I'm uh, really going over giving a secondary coat this is the uh, the base colour of the camouflage which um, is a characteristic of this particular style of camouflage you have to work around this way really because the material on the full size original probably would have been printed in the lightest colour first At this stage uh, there's no idea um, of uh, if there's any seepage underneath, underneath the masking but um, there's no need to panic because uh, more of the um, original grey can be put in the airbrush and that can be touched in either with the airbrush or uh, with a brush so uh, at this stage uh, there's absolutely no need to worry basic colours dried so uh, now we set about uh, seeing how well the masking has, uh, has worked sometimes you're quite lucky it'll just come off almost as a, as a, a one piece tweezers and a scalpel are handy to to do this but I think most of it's going to come off just with the tweezers we don't want any scratches on the, the nice matte finish. Might need a little bit of touching in here and there with a brush. But uh, that way you've got two base colours. Just going to run some paint around the edge of the smock where it joins where the trousers were masked off. This will just uh, make it a little bit more obvious of uh, what's the smock and what's, what's the trousers do what we can to make it less obvious that it's all one solid piece of resin. It's only really at this stage that you can uh, shade the lightest colour with any effect. What we're doing is shading the, the recessed areas. Most of this side I've added more detail with the shading and the other side here there's less of it which gives a contrast of the difference it makes. A lot of this will be covered up uh, later by the other colours of the camouflage. You can just build up very, very light, um, light overspraying of the base colour. It's almost translucent. So we've got to a stage now where I've added a secondary colour to the base colour of the jump smock. 
Now it uh, remains to add the secondary and, uh, and third colour, the red, brown and the green. Now uh, on close examination of the pictures there are um, jagged edged shapes, um, a bit similar to the splinter camouflage. What I'll do now is add some red, brown and green areas to make this a uh, three-tone camouflage. Obviously colours vary quite considerably um, from uniform to uniform something that's been debated for years. I think uh, the colour most suited uh, would be this field green. I'd like to use Vallejo for this colour to go over the top because you can atomise it through the airbrush nozzle. Just going to do a random random area. To reproduce the idea that there are basic shapes underneath this camouflage, what I've done is cut some zigzag shapes and what I'm going to reproduce is the hint that there's core shapes to the camouflage. It's a soft edge camouflage but uh, there are basically shapes involved in this as well. But you can only just about see those so what I'm going to do is just fog in the core of the shapes not an easy thing to, to reproduce. As you can see, I'm getting the uh, the random shapes on. Just give a more more of a feel of the of the full size camouflage. In actual fact, these uh, shapes are quite hard to make out. They need to be slightly slightly blended. So now we've got to a stage where we've we've done the green. It's time to add some red brown to the camouflage. And uh, again I'm doing the same thing with this as I did with the with the green. beginning to look more like uh, the camouflage you want it to look like. The thing is to repeatedly look at the, the pictures of the original and try to make a good uh, job of balancing the colours. So we're doing a subtle addition of these shapes again, just to give an idea that these are overprinted shapes on the material. Draw some parallel lines. Got some small slots in the masking tape. So what we've got now is a basic mask which uh, 
uh, we can overlay onto the figure and hopefully recreate the characteristic rain pattern. Spray through our mask and gently lift it off. Then we've got some some rain marks there and then move it across a little bit again smooth it down and again move it off and we're gradually building up what would normally be a bit of a tedious thing to do just uh, Uh, this is a more finished version uh, that I have now with a, a lot of extra work that's been done. I've actually readjusted some of the balance of the colours because I found that they were a little bit on the bright side and also like with AFVs it's difficult to get an even balance of the colours on a given area i.e. there could be too much red brown or, or too much green or too much of the dark yellow. I've actually uh, continued the rain pattern using a brush to get particularly um, difficult areas it's difficult to mask so the whole thing has been given the rain effect. I've just lined in all the pockets and details just to accentuate the lines of the garment just to show the shape of it. I'm going to shade underneath this pocket to make it look as though it's deeper. It's uh, a good idea just to, to rotate it until you're happy with a an angle that you can get the brush in. Just going to brush some water in there because I just want that to soften that edge. Again it's a matter of personal choice really, it's how you see something. Everybody sees things in a different uh, way. In fact I might approach the figure differently one day than, the, than another purely because of the light or interpretation from one day to the next might be different. Now as this material is puckered and isn't perfectly smooth. I'm just going to put some little lines in just to emphasize that it's not perfectly smooth. As you look around the figure you can see certain areas need a bit more emphasis than others. I've noticed there's a pocket here which there's a seam needs to be lined in. Again don't worry too much if you go over or make the line too thick because you can go back over and adjust this. Obviously that's within reason because there's areas that are airbrushed with a subtle graduation in tone so you can't always get away with brushing uh, directly over the top of something. Also I'm just going to use quite a dark border around where the Luftwaffe Eagle is. Although this is an SS Fallschirmjäger they use the um, equipment from the Luftwaffe. The really obvious scene that I've not done anything with is on this uh, shoulder. So to some degree this bordering is also in effect a shading technique. More subtle shading can be done with the airbrush and this is really a kind of more obvious exact shading. This is really revisiting all the places that the sculptor has lovingly produced with his skills with his sculpting. Just makes everything much more apparent and clear. Now there's a small flap here and uh, it doesn't really look very interesting at this stage but I'm hoping by using the techniques that I've just shown that we'll make that more of a feature and um, hopefully you'll see the idea of this technique and what I've been doing with the rest of the figure so as you can see it's just a blob of camouflage really but because it is a feature of the garment I'm going to try and, and, and bring that out a little bit so first of all I'm going to border it with the, the darker colour I'm going to do underneath. So already this looks more interesting because it's got this bordered. Now I'm going to go on to highlighting areas such as this so it makes that a lot more interesting and actually gives you that shape rather than it looking bland and mixing in with the rest of it. Right so I've mixed up some lighter version of the dark yellow colour. I've just added a drop of white and a slight drop of yellow to it 
just to make a marginally lighter version of the dark yellow and just going to emphasize the edge of this flat so that it actually enhances the shape and you can actually see it rather than it just blending in. I'm just going to run a series of tiny touches along that edge really to give an idea of wear and a highlight. It can look like wear and tear as well as uh, being a convenient highlight and then you can just blend that in with a drop of water just to soften it. And you can see now that you've actually got that the shape shows up whereas before it didn't. A little added interest rather than it being all one bland shape. This is my prized possession, my Iwata Micron Model B. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use it for um, doing some shading over the top of the camouflage. And it's going to be relatively subtle. I'm going to use a neutral tone over all three colours so I'm not actually shading individual colours, I'm shading the whole combinations of the three colours. I've mixed up some burnt sienna and some black in a very very thin mixture of um, the Vallejo model air burnt umber and, and black and also added to this rather than thinning with water I've used unusually their airbrush cleaner it's not usually what um, you would use, but I actually find that this atomizes through the nozzles really nicely. I prefer it to using any other thinning medium. So right at the bottom here, I'm just going to put a slight one in the red-brown here. Again, subtlety is the name of the game. It's probably very difficult to even see it, but it is there. This one's probably a little more obvious. I have to be careful not to go too mad and obliterate all of the detail. All those painted lines. But there are certain creases that would benefit from a little bit of uh, a little bit of emphasis. Where the grenade goes, that'd be a, a natural place to, to add shading. Now, because um, a lot of these creases are running the other way, um, I think it'd be a natural uh, thing to to move it on the horizontal. So it's easier to go into the creases. Trying to get it darker where it just appears underneath the belt and uh, then just let it fade out. The further down the crease it gets and the, the shallower the crease gets it just, just fades out. As you can see, the, the Micron B is very controllable at this sort of distance and uh, you can actually control it very, very accurately. So as you can see, it's gradually getting more and more subtle. Even some of the areas that have previously been shaded using other techniques can be revisited again and given a little bit more depth and the whole thing becomes even more subtle and uh, interesting. I'm just going to paint the basic flat areas of the webbing, uh, which is leather. I'm going to paint them in matte black and afterwards uh, that will be toned down with burnt umber and other colours to give it a little bit of texture and um, add a bit of interest here and there. Um, it's not really um, necessary to mask an area like this. The ammunition pouches will cover most of this area anyway, but I've found that it's wise just to paint it as neatly as you can anyway, because even if you take it for granted that it's going to be covered with something else, there's always the chance that something might spoil the effect. It's worth making a mental note if there are any bits that you think might need to be retouched. Best way to uh, do these sort of areas is to paint the outside line first and then fill it in afterwards.
I'm filling in that loop because that can actually give quite a nice backdrop to uh, emphasize that uh, D-ring when it's painted on rather than having a, a light background if it's black it will actually throw out the shape a lot better so uh, I've got to the stage now I've got the base color for the Y straps on which are leather the color I've used has got a slight sheen on it which is quite nice for the effect that I want at the same time that I've done this I'll put a base coat on the boots a mixture of uh, black and burnt umber again um, that will be a nice color to work from I don't want to go straight to jet black because I think a little bit of artist license can actually improve the look of leather but I think in this case I should probably use variations on a very dark brown uh, black mix I take care to get the top edge in first and then anything below that is dead easy it will just flow again there's no need to uh, to mask these for airbrushing I might add some highlights with lighter shades with the airbrush later but that still won't require any form of masking just careful aiming of the airbrush I've got the basic leather colour already done on the Y straps and the boots I've already painted the pouches in the same colour but what I need to do now is to slightly distress them and make them look a little bit more worn and more realistic so to that end what I've got is some Vallejo sandy brown and what I'm going to do is dry brush which means that you get a, an old brush and cut it off to a, a square top the idea is to get that very very tacky and dry so a bit of uh, old cardboard is, is an ideal thing just to rotate the, the head of the brush so practically nothing's coming off of it now the idea is to make light passes over the top of the item and it should start to pick up round the edges and you should have slight distressed edges as leather gets scuffed and used so the, the black surface gets damaged so you really want to concentrate on the, the edges that would be scuffed and worn hopefully you can see there there's the difference between a treated and untreated pouch Right, we've got all the pouches painted and ready to go on the figure. So we're quite fortunate that the um, keys and everything are quite obvious where the pieces actually mount to. So put in some cyanoacrylate glue and then just wiggle that into position. And that's, uh, that's the first lot. Now the others are actually individually designed to fit in their allotted spaces. Which is, the, got the two circles to finish things off. And rather than looking perfectly lined up they look quite natural because they're a little bit up and down and uh, not perfectly straight which is good we now come on to a really important part of the figure um, it's a make or break um, part of any figure flesh tone now really a lot of what's involved with producing a realistic flesh tone is really looking at pictures um, looking at people um, in a word observation really it's not always uh, easy to get an idea of natural flesh tones by looking at printed things because uh, there are unnatural colors made from a four color process uh, I tend to mix my own flesh tones from colors that I've become uh, used to over a period of time one of the colors that I've found is that's invaluable for mixing a flesh tone is sandy brown which is a, a model air color and it seems unusual to use a sandy brown but uh, is actually a very good base flesh tone color other colors that um, are good for mixing flesh tones are also burnt umber and burnt sienna mixed with white can make a very good flesh tone the head and the hands all being flesh tone have been base coated with a a light to medium tone of a mixture of uh, sandy brown and white which gives this light flesh tone I'll work over the top of this basic uh, light flesh tone with progressively darker tones of the same color and eventually maybe some burnt umber to give some depth to the shadows such as the extreme shadows underneath the jawline I'm going to look at all of the natural or naturally shaded areas of the face and head and hopefully exaggerate or accentuate those uh, using colour these are areas such as under the cheekbones and underneath the jawline and above and below the eyes this is really just going to be a light build up just to get an idea of how the face will look so I'm just building the colour up underneath the, 
So at this stage, I don't know where you can see, there's uh, just a little bit of colour building up there. So we're really purely relying on the, the base flesh tone for the highlights. You're working from light to dark and what appears light to begin with will be the highlighted uh, colour. For the highlights I'm going to use Createx which is an airbrush paint uh, and this is actually a pre-mixed flesh tone colour. Um, it's a very pale colour. It's got a slightly more pinkish uh, tinge to it and I think um, over the top of colour I've already used it will actually take away a little bit of the, the yellowish uh, tone which is more of a tan sort of look. Right so I'm going to uh, use this colour on the highlights which are the forehead, the bridge of the nose and the nostrils, um, the top of the cheeks, and the, the hot to highlight the cheekbones, um, the chin and the either side of the top lip. The jawbone is also another. And as I'm just doing this highlight here it leaves the, the crease there still shaded. Um, that's the good thing about this particular airbrush, you can actually target very small areas indeed. So we've got um, the other colour over the top now which is making it look a little bit more interesting. Um, it's it's uh, highlighted the, the flesh tone but I will go back to use another darker shade. Right, so now I've done the highlights, I'm actually going to go back again and do some uh, shading to darken some of the shading to give a, get a little bit more contrast. I'm just going to exaggerate the cheekbones a little bit more. Right, so we've got the, the overall skin tone quite nicely there now. So that's uh, pretty much ready to detail the, the eyes and uh, the rest of the, the face. Right now, we've got to this stage, the brush will take over where the airbrush is, is uh, it's not totally finished, but um, for the flesh tone, it's kind of 95% finished. We're going to start doing the eyes. Now I usually find that by putting the whites of the eyes in first uh, usually uh, the best way for me. So I'm going to use um, naturally enough white but um, I'm not actually going to use pure white. I'm going to add some, in this case the sandy brown which is the same flesh colour just to take the starkness of the white down so that it looks um, more of an off-white. It's a little bit lighter than the, the lightest flesh tone colour. So this comes at the point where you need to make sure that you've got a firm base to paint and then using the tip of the brush just take it to one side just gently let it go into the area. I find it quite interesting um, to look at uh, pictures and to look at people and uh, see how the direction of eyes and uh, the position of the head and, and everything can be taken into consideration to create drama or a certain sort of expression or whatever. Um, with this particular figure he'll be looking slightly to his left. Um, they're not going to be perfectly centred but slightly to the left. So I'm just going to put the, the second base colour in for the pupil. So we've uh, got the whites of the eyes in and the outside of the pupil colour. I'm now going to paint the actual inside colour of the eye, leaving a, an outside ring uh, of the dark colour. 
but basically we're just looking at concentric circles for the eye. When the eyes are centred in facing forward that you don't really see very much uh, white of uh, anybody's eyes and uh, that can look really unnatural and almost like a, a cat or something. So um, here we have the eyes positioned ready for the iris to be added in black. Just practice uh, loading the brush and using the tip because really you're acting on the paint to form into a nice circular droplet as it goes onto the eye. The thing is to make sure that your hand is firm and settled on the table first for this. Use your other fingers as a rest and then it's just a question of trying to get the brush in as close as possible. It's great if you can get one in and if you can get two in and they match then it's even better. It, uh, it doesn't always happen that way, but let's see what we can do. Can go back to the other one, make it slightly bigger. If one's slightly bigger than the other, you can go from one to the other to make them match as best you can. I'm quite happy that they're quite a good match. What I use is Vallejo Gloss Varnish. It's got a bluish tinge to it when it's still wet, uh, but it dries to a really nice deep shine. Once this is floated onto the eyes, it really picks up the reflection nicely and they almost look like tiny glass eyes. One final detail that needs to be added to the corner of the eye is the, um, the tiny pinkish coloured dot in the corner of the eye where the, where the tear duct would be. As I've done him with brown eyes, I think his hair is going to be dark brown. So I think that'll make a good contrast. I'm just going to paint individual tiny lines where his moulded eyebrows are indicated rather than just blocked in as one big mass. You can get a much better effect going down to almost if there's the odd tiny hair. And where it thickens you just build up several small lines. Now the hair, again that's something that it's not a good idea just to blob it in in one big lump. By well, using the tip of the brush you can actually get the, the shapes of the individual clumps of hair nicely and it actually looks quite convincing rather than just looking like a, a massive blob. By taking care just to do individual strands of hair and really pay dividends. This is actually thinned to the point where it's uh, going on as one layer and it's actually shading itself the base flesh colour is acting like a, a, a nice background for the burnt umber and in the moulded detail it's actually going darker. Now I'm just going to put another coat clear gloss on the eyes just to give an extra bit of gloss. Right I'm going to add another little detail now which is the stubble on his chin seems strange but I actually used blue for that added to the colour that I used earlier for the highlights I'm just going to add a tiny drop of black to that and drop more blue and I'm going to mix a very very thin mixture of this it's a very subtle effect just do it along the jawline and a little bit on the, the top lip that's the stubble effect. The final job to do on the face is to just add a, a little drop of red to the cheeks. In fact I'm going to use some orange and a little drop of red mixed together. What I'll actually be applying is, is a very very fine subtle spray of this. You don't really want too much at all. So it's literally just a hint of it on the cheeks. on the bridge of the nose and that's it it's time to put his head on let's see uh, the, the crowning glory hopefully and uh, let's see how that goes obviously we, we uh, test fitted it and it should all go on quite nicely and there we have it